Hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we are back again with another 101 video and based on the feedback I received for the hair pulling one, I decided it was definitely a good idea to go back and revisit some so-called like basic or simple forms of BDSM play. So today, what we are going to be talking about is scratching and clawing. Now, I don't have any exact numbers for this, and it certainly graces far fewer covers of erotic novels compared to, say, handcuffs, but it seems like this is an activity that very oftentimes serves as a transition point when somebody is wanting to experiment with more kinky play in their life but isn't yet comfortable with things that are more BDSM specific. So with that in mind, what I want to do in today's video is break down what this form of play is, where it comes from, why people do it, different ways to approach this play depending on your skill level. So I am going to be giving advice not just for beginners but also for intermediate and more advanced players as well. And then of course the usual safety information on top of that. But let's go ahead and get into it. Let us start off with our usual discussion of what is this play? Now, this is actually very straightforward. Forward. I did not run into any contradictory cosmopolitan articles like I have in some of my previous 101 videos. Scratching is basically what it sounds like. It's a natural human behavior that usually happens as a reaction to a stimulus that's causing you to want to scratch. Like for example, I want to scratch my shoulder right now because I have a single hair that's like floating right there. So it's a very natural thing that a lot of people just do without even thinking about it. What is interesting though is people can also use it in an intimate context without any stimulus for the scratching and still have it be pleasurable. This is most commonly associated with fingernails, but actually in a BDSM scene there are lots of other tools that you can use for scratching, such as claws, which I will be exploring in more depth later on in this video. But why clawing and scratching? Now, I could just say that it's because scratching feels nice and just leave it at that. But of course, this wouldn't be a 101 video if I just gave it that level of superficiality. So actually, let's talk a little bit about the history of scratching in human behavior. Scratching does actually have a long history in the world of human evolution. Originally, it evolved as a way of removing pests from the body, so things like lice. But as human anatomy would have it, it can be quite difficult to reach the back sides of our body. And so over time, human groups developed a tendency to scratch each other's backs in order to remove those pests. And that served an important function to help the group stay healthy and strong because different types of parasites were removed from the body. And so naturally over time, that just became something that that was an important part of keeping a group safe and healthy and strong. But over time, this actually evolved to be something that was independent of any particular stimulus. It became a pro-social interaction. It became a form of social grooming where it was actually a way of having social bonds and just general group cohesion be formed because of the scratching happening. It helped people understand that they were part of an in-group, they were safe, that they were being cared for, and this is something that lasts to this very day. If you go to the zoo and you look at primates, you will see that they are socially grooming each other, humans totally do the same thing, it's an instinct that we still have, and so scratching feels nice for all of those reasons, and it can help people feel calm, it can help people feel relaxed, it can help people feel like they are being cared for. Some people, because of how strong of a connection it has can be sexually aroused by the presence of scratching. That is why it's like so common as shorthanded movies to see like a woman running her nails down the back of her partner when she's in a lot of pleasure. And of course for people in the BDSM community it also has a lot of links to things like rough body play, primal play, and pet play. Based on what I have described so far, you would definitely be forgiven for thinking that this doesn't really sound all that kinky. And that's actually a surprise. It's 
not really all that kinky, not in and of itself anyways. It all depends on the headspace you go into things with, it all depends on the mindset you have, the intention you have, and honestly that's true for a lot of BDSM activities. There are many, many things that can straddle the line between vanilla and kinky, and depending on the intent you have behind that, it determines the way that that thing falls. That being said, however, there are very substantive differences in the ways that these things are actually acted out. So, like I've mentioned before, somebody scratching down their partner's back when they're in a lot of pleasure during sexual intercourse is very different from somebody who is purposely doing a sensation play scene that's going on for two, three hours where somebody's skin is literally being scratched raw. So again, it's really that different in mindset. It's that difference in approach. And there's nothing wrong with either one of these two approaches. I think there's a tendency in the BDSM community to kind of like look down on these seemingly more simplistic, more vanilla-ish forms of play. And for me, that's really not the case. I would really encourage you, if you are somebody who maybe has that kind of inclination, to rethink why you might have that reaction. There's nothing wrong with anybody preferring one approach over the other. It's more about being aware of what you want to get out of a scene and being able to effectively communicate to your partner what that is. Be that the more ca casual approach you might have in a vanilla sexual situation or the more intentional approach that you might have with a sadistic focused BDSM scene. And also scratching is not restricted to one side of the slash or another. You can be a bottom and really enjoy the sensation. You can be a top or a dom and really enjoy the sensation. Again, I'm going to keep repeating this. It really boils down to the intent that you have. Using scratching or claws on your partner can be a way of having a bonding experience. That can be from a service perspective or that can be from a sadistic perspective, that can be from a dominant perspective. It really depends and there's a lot of variety you have if you decide you want to engage in this type of play. Speaking of which, let us get into how do you actually do this type of play. Now what I really love about scratching and clawing is it is something that is very accessible to many different people. It is something that is based on a natural human inclination. And so because of that, I will be breaking this down into three categories, beginner, intermediate, and advanced applications of scratching and clawing. So let us start out with the beginner level. This is assuming that you have very little to no experience with BDSM at all, let alone this activity. And in this regard, I would probably recommend you start out with something that's very simple, very naturalistic. I would either stick with the tips of your fingers or with nails. If you go to say Bed Bath & Beyond or Amazon, there are even like back scratching tools you can get as well if you want to play around with more of the tool aspect of scratching and clawing. And I would really approach this as a way uh, to incorporate this into other activities you might already be doing. So for example, if you're starting with like no BDSM experience at all, you can incorporate this into a sensual massage or into a neck rub. If you are somebody who has a little bit of experience playing with other forms of BDSM, it makes a great form of sensation play. You can mix it with other things such as wax play or with ice cubes or tickling. If you're more on the bondage side of things, you can do this while wearing a blindfold or having cuffs on if you like that sense of restriction. If you are somebody who is into BDSM primarily for sexual purposes, clawing makes a great addition to that and it's something that a lot of people do during their sexual activities and it doesn't even really have to be a BDSM thing. And because scratching is a more natural human inclination, it's something that you don't really need to have a lot of good technique for like you would for say whips or flogging before you start to get into it. What I would focus in on though is thinking about the amount amount of pressure that you're using and how long you are sticking around one area. Because you are doing something that is on another human's body, it can be difficult to tell exactly how they perceive things versus what it feels like for you when you were doing the same thing on your own body. So start out light and work your way up. Also be sure to talk to your partner about staying in one area versus going over the same area again and again. Some people really like it if you just stick on one place and you're like, 
like, <laughs> not literally like that, but like the idea of doing something repeatedly in one area. Other people really like it when it's more of a full body experience, when you know you're going from the neck to the arms to the torso to the legs to the feet and then all the way back up again. It really depends on what the people you are playing with want, so just make sure you have the opportunity to talk about that before you start incorporating it into your play. And then we get more into the intermediate level. This is where I would start introducing more BDSM specific tools for this. And the one thing, the number one thing I recommend would be to get a set of metal claws. There are many different people these days that make metal claws. The recommendation I have for you guys is Hammerfell Armory. They have a fat life as well as a website, although their website is pretty janky, so I'd probably just go to their fat life. And they have been making claws for a long time. They have a background in medieval blacksmithing. So if you are part of like the CSA LARPing community, you may have even run across their work already. And they frequently go to a lot of different events to vend their wares. I've even seen them sold in a few different online sex boutiques. But point being they are very well known and their products last for a very long time. I have probably played with at least half a dozen different Hammerfell Armory sets of all sorts of different ages and they last very very well and their range of sizes, their custom coloring, it really can't be beat. They absolutely know what they are doing and they're pretty inexpensive. I believe it's $20 for one claw and you can get a full hand for 75 So compared to a lot of other kink toys like floggers, it is very affordable. And even if you only get one claw, it can make a massive difference in your scene. If you are somebody who is more on the intermediate side of things, for example, you can incorporate this with just like one claw and one blindfold and have a very, very intense scene that way, particularly if you're playing around with like Ooh, do they know where like the sensation is going to be coming from next? Do they know where it's going to be? And that can be a thrill even for somebody who is an absolute hardcore masochist. And even if you don't actually physically use the claws at all, for a lot of people, particularly people who are into bird play or kitten play, it can be a great way to get into a more role play mindset. And the last thing I want to note here is that while I've talked a lot about Hammerfell Armory, there are other places online where you can get claws. I do not personally have experience with any of them besides Hammerfell Armory. I have handled like a few sets and then literally decided not to play with them because I knew that Hammerfell Armory was better. If you are really looking for something on a budget, there are other options out there. They're a little bit more flexible, the metal is cheaper, but really, if you want my honest opinion, if you're gonna get into clawing, get yourself a hammer fall claw or a full set and you will not be remiss for it. But no matter what design you go with, you will notice that a claw is a lot more intense than human fingernails. So you really, really need to be in touch with your partner, you really need to be able to be controlled with exactly the tempo you're using, the amount of pressure, the locations that you're staying on around the body. Something as well to keep in mind when you are playing with claws is you can use them pretty much anywhere on the body that you want, depending on how much pressure you're using. If you want something that goes more into fear play territory, if you want something that's gonna be more emotionally intense, more mentally intense, using things around the neck, down the back, down the spine, getting into the inner thigh area. If you really want somebody to squirm, if you like tickling play, going around the sides of the body can be a good thing as well, however, for some people, fear play, getting into that more mentally intense headspace is not good for them. For some people, metal claws, particularly around the throat, can provoke an unexpected negative reaction. So just be prepared for that. Some people really experience like a sudden headspace shift when they have anything around their neck or even just claws might be the only thing that causes that. So just something to keep in mind if you are going into those more intense places. But now that I have ranted for a hot minute about claws, let 
us get into the more advanced territory. Like I have already mentioned, this is something that pairs really well with a lot of other types of BDSM play. So if you are somebody who is already quite skilled in other areas, claws can be a great addition to that play. If you're into electro play, pairing claws with a violet wand is a very popular option. It really amps up the sensation. Huh? Shout out to watch the same word there. It really amps up the sensation if you want to incorporate the claws into an electro play scene. If you're into rope bondage, if you're doing something like a Fudo Momo or a Guatemalan, something where there is a lot of pressure around one area of the body, the areas where the flesh is exposed or where the rope has been, if it's been removed, are typically a lot more sensitive. So using claws around them or after the rope has been taken off can feel more intense than it would have been had the skin just been left as is during the duration of the scene. Claws also have a wonderful ability of having sort of built-in temperature play. Now, if you're at the top, you either have to kind of be comfortable with the cold or the hot around your fingers, or you can possibly wear the claws on top of gloves if you're not. But with this, what you would be doing is basically dipping the claws in cold and hot water, kind of leaving them for a while so the metal can either absorb heat or lose heat depending on what you're going with and then running those over the body. And if you do that intensely enough, if you are really creating a temperature gradient there, it can be a wonderful mind fuck scene where you are creating the sensation of cutting the skin open or that you are creating a brand or a burn or something else and that can be a great way to explore that type of play because it's not really something a lot of people have the skill set to do in reality in a fully safe way. And that brings me on to what I want to talk about next, which is the safety information portion of this video. Like I have already said, Claws and scratching are a naturalistic human behavior. Of course, adding tools to that does change things, but even for the most natural forms of play that we have, it is something that still has an element of risk to it. And in order to make sure that everybody is getting closer to full awareness, able to create their own risk profile for this play, I really wanna make sure we get into some safety information. And so number one is skin is dirty and so are you. There are thousands and thousands and millions of little bacteria and spores and God knows what else floating around in the air and on our clothes and on our skin and on our toys. Unless you are doing like full on surgical prep sanitization procedures and you're in a totally sterile room, there are going to be things just are in the atmosphere around you, that means that there is always going to be a chance that when you are going up against the skin, you are transferring bacteria, you are transferring disease, you are transferring other things. Now, with claws compared to some other things, there is a low level of risk, if you're using them correctly, that you will actually break skin, but sometimes skin breaks can actually be so small that you might not see them there. And in particular, if you're going over the same area again and again and again, and the skin is really being rubbed raw, that is going to be when there's more of the potential for that kind of thing to happen. Now, like I've mentioned, there is a difference between clean and being sanitized. Unless you are following really, really specific procedures, you cannot sanitize things, but you can clean them and you can overall make a better experience. I have seen and heard so many people who just like sneeze and cough and touch their faces and don't wash anything before starting a scene or before doing anything else that would, you know, actually be a good idea to do before you start doing a scene. Like, if you're doing those things, if you've been in a public school, you know about the hand washing rules, you know about how to cover your coughs and your sneezes, make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're washing your hands. It's important. Please do it. And especially if you're playing in a public setting, if you're playing with multiple people, it's a really great way to make sure that everybody in your community gets the flu at the same time. Don't be that person. Follow the public health safety guidelines that are out there and make sure that you are following those procedures before you get into a scene, before you start touching another person's bare skin. Just something to keep in mind. And now that leads me on to number two, which is to clean your toys. I'm gonna talk about both 
bare hands and metal claws. If you're using wood, if you are using bone, if you're using something else, this doesn't really apply here. There are different procedures depending on the type of material that you are using. If you're using bare hands, again, follow that good hand washing procedure. If you have longer nails, make sure to use a scrub brush and like really get under there, get any debris out from your nails. It's going to produce a better sensation and it's gonna be like overall better for your partner because you're not like transferring all of the like dirt and grime from your kitchen and bathroom like onto your partner's skin so just be thoughtful if you don't have access to hot water and soap you can use an alcohol based hand sanitizer 60 percent alcohol content or above is what the cdc recommends however it may not be as effective as eliminating all types of bacteria as a traditional soap and water method might do if you're using metal claws, you have a lot of options here because metal is something that actually can be cleaned quite easily. You can theoretically autoclave your claws if you're that level of person and you happen to just have an autoclave that's accessible. Besides that, you can use isopropyl alcohol wipes. 70% alcohol or above would do the job and that can help keep them clean between uses and between using them on different partners. And that brings me on to my third point, which is drawing blood and accidental punctures. I really want to emphasize this here. Claws and scratching are not intended to draw blood, and it is not synonymous with blood play. I know it's really hot in your fantasies and your fan fiction to have the nice little picture of like drawing down somebody's back and watching the ruby red liquid spurt out of their skin and create patterns down their back and blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, at least as far as my risk profile as an educator is concerned, clawing and scratching are not synonymous with blood play and should not typically be done with the purpose of drawing blood unless very specifically negotiated. There is a huge, huge difference in risk profile and potential to cause infection or transfer diseases if you are doing something where the intent is to draw blood. Your hands and metal claws are not typically designed to cut open skin. There are very specific procedures and tools and methodology that you should be aware of if you want to engage in this with the intent to draw blood. However, because this is YouTube, because I don't know who is going to be watching this video, I cannot really get into that information in this. If you want to know about more about blood play, if you want to know more about that in general, I do have a video where I interviewed somebody who is an expert in that. You can watch it down below. And I really, really encourage you that you would go to classes. You would talk to people in your local community that do this on a regular basis to really make sure you are getting the knowledge you need to engage in that in a safe and informed way. But that being said, I do want to acknowledge that there is also the likelihood of an accidental drawing of blood or accidental puncture. If you were doing this with rough body play, with primal play, with pet play, if it's not really strictly controlled, claws or even fingernails can break through the skin and that does happen. So with any kind of play, really keeping a basic first aid kit on hand is really helpful. And if you are in a public dungeon setting where this does happen, please, please, please feel encouraged, feel empowered to get a DM. I know it can be embarrassing, but they should have supplies that can help you out if you do come across a situation where this does happen. And switching gears, I also want to make sure to mention the mental and emotional risks of this type of play just really, really clearly. I already touched on this in the previous section, but for some people, claws scratching are like a really fun, happy, relaxed place. It's something that they love doing and it always produces a really, really nice sensation for them and they just love it. Other people, it goes into a more fear play territory that can still be a positive thing. And for some other people, depending on where it is on the body or just in general, it can produce an un unexpected negative response. It can set off people's fight or flight response. It can make people feel really afraid or vulnerable. It can make people feel a lot of really intense things basically. And so when you are negotiating with somebody for this type of play, I would always make sure to ask them how they might expect 
to react mentally based on previous experience. If they haven't done this at all before, make sure you bring up the possibility that, you know, there is a chance that for some people this does cause a negative reaction and that you're acknowledging this and kind of get a game plan together if that does happen during the scene. Again, it's not something that happens to everybody, but it is important to talk about because if it does happen and you have no idea what to do, do, that is more likely to produce a negative outcome than if you would have addressed it in an appropriate manner because you were expecting that there could be that possibility. And finally, scratching can leave marks. This is like the opposite of the one I mentioned about blood play. Like some people are like solely into clawing because they want to draw blood and like all of that stuff and other people are like, but it's just scratching. How can it leave marks? Scratching can leave marks everybody's skin reacts differently. Some people, you can claw the absolute shit out of them for like hours and hours and 10 minutes after the scene is going to be like nobody ever touched them. Other people, you scratch them once and they're going to have a bright red line there in that spot for like two weeks afterwards. Those are, are kind of some extremes, but you should expect that in the course of doing play involving claws or fingernails, anything like that, you could leave marks. And it's really important to talk about this with people ahead of time because different people have work situations, have family situations, just general life stuff, their own personal comfort, health, safety, whatever, means that they can't have lasting marks on their skin. For some people, it's only in certain places, for other people, it's anywhere in their body at all. So make sure again, so everybody can give full informed consent to the play that you're doing, that everyone is aware that this can leave marks. There is a possibility that you can spot test before scenes, you know, just do one little mark, you know, on a shoulder or somewhere discreet on the body. And you can check and see, okay, this is kind of what your reaction is to this. Are you comfortable with this for a certain amount of time? And you can come back here and revisit the possibility of play later. Or maybe you find out that like, oh, okay, that's totally fine. And you can go right into it. All just totally depends. Again, it's about being able to give that risk aware, informed consent for the play that's going on. And I think that's everything I really wanted to mention in today's video. If you have any comments or questions for me about this or anything else, you can leave that down in the comment section below. If you like this video, if you want to see more from me, please subscribe. I make videos twice a week. And finally, if you really enjoyed this video, if you want to see more from me, you can do that over on Patreon. That is what keeps this channel going. That is what allows me to make videos like this. And as well, uh, I can put a lot more on there that I can't do on YouTube. So if you want things like tutorials and demos, mo more personal videos, that kind of thing, that is all over on Patreon. If you already support me on there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. If you haven't already, check it out. Link will be down in the description box. But until I see you guys next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.